because he always covers women when he talks about them. <laughs> By the way, before we begin the mediation, you guys are ready for the packet. How old is Jason? Eleven. Can we make him nine and a half? You know why? Oh, for because of the statute. Yeah, let's assume that the statute, the chapter 233-81 for the criminal and 83 for care and protection, let's assume that that might apply so that you guys can argue about that too. But uh, certainly Alicia's over that age. So he's How just changed that back. What? Jason. Danielle? What's the matter? I was just trying to find his age in there. Okay. Yeah. Jonathan's one of the spring. Okay, so Jason's nine and a half. That, that way we don't have to worry about does the statute apply or not. All right, so uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Paul Elvis, and I have with me uh, Lily Shaw. We're, we have been appointed by the uh, uh, Lowell Juvenile Court to uh, mediate a Karen protection case regarding the Lee children. Um, because Mr. Lee is also being criminal, criminally prosecuted, the suggestion was that the district attorney's office be involved in this mediation as well. So can we just go around first and tell us who you are and who you represent? And we'll start with Alana. And Jonathan is who? He is the youngest son. So I believe he's two or three. Okay. I'm Kelly Rogers. I'm the guardian ad litem representing the children. Okay. I'm Elizabeth Trask, defense counsel for Mr. Lee. Okay. I'm Ashley Lord, and I'm Alicia's attorney. And Alicia's how old, um, Ashley? 12 years old. Okay. I'm Marina Dworkin. I represent Jason, and Jason is nine and a half years old. Thank you. Danielle Thomason, I'm the district attorney. Okay. I'm Tom and I, uh, attorney for the uh, ECF. And I'm okay. in a motion, I'm court investigator. Okay. If you wouldn't mind, Danielle, and I'm just going to use first names if that's okay with everybody. Mm -hmm. Oh, did I use both? No, first names to you. Because <laughs> <laughs> I forget your last names. Oh, Normally yeah, I would good. be like attorney so and so. Um, sure. Oh, yes, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> Now, Danielle, since this uh, 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 case or number of cases actually started when uh, Mr. Lee uh, was uh, being arraigned for the sexual assault of Justin, could you s start the s story for us of the whole case? The story, how this ca how this case got started, and in order to do that, you've got to go back in time to. Uh, 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 the district attorney's office deciding to prosecute Mr. Lee for the uh, sexual molestation and rape of the neighbor, Justin. So if you could just summarize and start with that, with those facts. Okay. All right. And at that, so go ahead. Um, 
So Mr. Lee was arrested. Mm -hmm. And do you want me to get into how his children were? Yeah, brought he, in so while he was, was arrested. In, yes, while he was in jail, the DSS was. Was he in jail? Was, he hadn't been jailed earlier, right? Yes. He was, was, he was in jail? jail? Custody. No, they arrested him on the morning of Tuesday, the twenty first, at ten a.m. And then they went and got the. He was arrested. So what do you mean? Was he in jail? He, they they arrested him, and at the time that he was in custody, they went. The was he not being arraigned? Police. 
officer? Police officer, which police officer? Yeah. Not just a police officer. Oh, okay, it was, it was the, uh, the woman police officer Kathy was was the she notified uh, DSS of the arrest of charges. Okay, and so how did that come about? How did uh, how does Kathy Kathy's the police officer, correct? Yes. How does Kathy get involved in the Lee family case? Well, then the, then the social worker Ellen went to the police station and I guess uh, no, um, Okay, so well, how did that happen? would have been filed. Okay. By the police department. By the police department. Right. Okay. They filed oh. 51A, which went to the intake social worker. Okay. That then dispatched a social worker. And you've got that in your officer. packet. You have that in your packet, correct? Okay. All right, good. So, going to the home as part of the 51B investigation, Norman. Yes. Are two people, right? And you mentioned who they were. The um, Jason was there. Wait, wait. Who went to the home? Oh, I'm sorry. The social worker. Okay, let's give her a name. Ellen. So, Ellen. Okay. And Kathy, the, the police officer. Okay. So that's it. Was screened in as a member, and I said for some reason non-emergency was checked off, but they immediately did go to the home while Lee was in court and/or the police station. Ellen and Kathy went to the home. So that's the 51B part of it. That's the investigation. So they go to the home, all right. And when they got there, uh, Jason was there with with Jonathan and uh, Alicia was babysitting, you know, a few apartments down. Really? Okay. All right. 
So we have state. Uh, what did the department do next? And what does that mean, put them all into custody? Um, well, they took Alicia and she went to stay with the grandparents. And then they all went to the station first. Right. The station? The they they police station? station. To, the, to the department? To the department offices, correct? Okay. All right. And so they were they basically, all, says they all went to the station. Basically, the, the important thing is, is they were removed from the home, correct? While Mr. your client was not there, your client was in court or and Ruth he's somehow he's coming back from the uh, criminal piece of it. Got released. Okay, okay. Um, so Alicia was placed with the grandparents, and, and then Jason uh, went to his uncle's. And what about Jonathan? Good 
So grades, grades haven't gone down or? No, the okay. uh, teachers never had any observations, direct or indirect, of uh, any uh, physical or emotional abuse that the children were suffering. That, and children live only with Mr. Lee? Yes. Where is the uh, mother? mother is, uh, she's deceased. She okay. um, uh, had her unfortunate a car accident and she died. And uh, that put a lot of st uh, stress on the family because the father was... Uh, so any evidence that children exhibited trauma uh, relative to their mother's death? Or? Um, since it uh, was a long time ago, um, it, the, the could be stressed by that event, but since uh, but nobody that, talk, talked to or, or no, uh, no. After that, sources. they were very. They had a lot of friends, and they they were uh, like uh, as far as the teachers' observation, they were normal kids, though without any any abnormalities. Now you yourself met with the children too, correct? Um, yes. And when. Uh, when I met with the children, they uh, were they refused any sexual abuse. That sexual abuse took place. Uh, I spoke to Alicia and uh, independently and Jason, and they said they were never abused by their father. What if any statements did they make to you regarding their father? Um, the only instance that they uh, mentioned to me is that one instance when he ordered them to get naked in front of each other because they were getting into some arguments and uh, over the use of a bathroom. So as a punishment, he told them to uh, reveal their clothes. But that was the only incident that they mentioned. They would not mention any other sexual uh, intercourse or anything like that. that Is there anybody else that you talked to or uh, any other uh, evidence or records that you looked at that you haven't mentioned? Um, talk to the Anthony, who's a, uh, the uncle. uncle. Okay. Yeah. Um, and and uh, that would be Lee's brother, the uncle. That would be uh, his half brother. Okay. Uh, and he said that he spoke with children, and the children again, um, they always uh, referred to Lee as a wonderful father, and they never complained about uh, any sexual. And do you have any recommendations regarding custody or the, or uh, the future the of this case? The recommendation is to give a temporary custody to uh, uh, Department of um, Social Services and um, to create a service plan uh, to include the referral of father to, uh, um, to undergo a um, complete treatment program for sexual offenders and to refer all three children to a sexual abuse trauma unit for complete evaluation and treatment um, as recommended by the doctors who they saw. So you think that re reunification is a possibility? Yes, we, we, after talking to all, to the children again, um, to um, the teachers and relatives, we think that um, there is a possibility to um, really um, protect now, Kelly, you're the guiding and light them. You have a your position is a little bit different from the court-appointed investigator. So, why don't you uh, tell us? Uh, about it. Yes, uh, my my position is the protection of the children and the interests of the children. Um, the the allegations of abuse um, seem to be uh, pretty much justified in the fact that the father has has acknowledged that he has had some inappropriate activity. But when you say that, and I didn't hear from Danielle or Norman, but they may have gotten that fact, who did, who did Lee speak to uh, in the department and he may have made, made some particular statement? Is that what you're referring to? Yes. I believe, I believe it was to the social worker. What did he say? Was it in the nature of an admission or? It, it was, it was vague. Um, when was it that he first spoke with Ellen? 
that um, he came in after he was uh, arraigned for the first criminal case. Oh, okay, and his children yes. were gone. His children were okay. gone. He went to the DSS office to speak with the worker. Okay. Um, at which point the social worker gave um, the dates as far as the care and protection case and what was happening with his children. Uh, that's when um, it said, the, um, the worker asked him about his involvement with children. He stated he doesn't recall how it started or why. It, okay. He remembers crying after it happened. The worker pressed father for details. Um, he stated he, he really doesn't recall the details. Um, he didn't feel that the children's time frame was correct about the frequency, but it did start shortly after Cindy died. Cindy being five Cindy, or mom. Yes. Okay. Yes. So what are your concerns that might differ from um, Alina, the investigator's so, recommendation? So, you know, my, my concerns are strictly with the children and keeping them protected um, from the father um, as, as far as keeping them, you know, isolated from further abuse. Uh, my other concern <laughs> will be their, um, their emotional needs as far as when it comes to time to testify in the care and protection case far as what kind of emotional disturbance that may have um, testifying against their father. Not 
admitting he's not going to do any sexual abuse stuff. He might do something else. So he's co cooperating to a certain extent, but because he's got the criminal case limit against him, so keep that in mind. Okay. Let me hear from Ashley, who's um, the oldest child's attorney, right? Alicia, so I'll go with you and then Jonathan. And, and I'm, I'm then Jason's attorney and then Jonathan. Okay. Um, so originally, Ellen and Officer Kathy came and they spoke with Alicia and they asked her questions about whether or not she had ever been abused and what specifically happened. Yeah, what, what is your client's sort of, what is your client's position in the camera protection case if that's what really concerns, you know, her the most and you're representing her in the camera protection Right. Um, so Alicia's position is that she made some statements that her, um, her father made her and her brother sleep together and that her father hadn't ever touched her inappropriately. But Alicia was under the impression when she made these statements that she would be able to stay with her father and that they were just going to make the bad things that were happening stop. So Alicia ultimately wants to reconcile with her father and kind of work out the issues. Um, Marina, you represent Jason. Right, Jason is a nine and a half year old. He's not a biological son of uh, Mr. Lee, but he was adopted by Mr. Lee. Okay. Um, Jason was, uh, Jason described his relationship with his father as a good one. Um, he actually wants again to reunite with his father. Um, Jason. And he has recanted his earlier statements as well. Right, and uh, that's true as well. And um, he, even in the beginning, he didn't want to admit to any uh, sexual improper behavior. He just um, says that if his father touches him, that's only when they wrestle, but that he didn't find this inappropriate. And only under pressure of his sister Alicia, he started, uh, he started telling us more details about what had happened. Um, he actually, uh, we learned that he was directed by his father to conduct some sexual activity toward his sister. So he was directed to do so um, against his uh, wishes. And these are all, again, through the statements of, of Ellen and Kathy. Right, correct. No, um, not what Jonathan is saying now, correct? No, not what Jason okay. is saying. I mean, and Jason. Mm -hmm. No, but um, the, uh, the fear that the uh, Jason will be under control of the DSS services, um, he doesn't want that. He wants to stay in touch with his father. He's very attached to his uh, paternal uncle and and he was the whole family to be united. And he was also concerned about his um, younger brother, Jonathan. So he wants the family to be together. And he knows that Jonathan is very upset that he's alone. He does not understand what's going on. So he wants to be in touch with his brother. Okay. Thank you. And Alani, you represent the youngest child, Jonathan, who uh, is a subject in the care protection petition, but uh, no allegations of sexual abuse have been made by the department. What's your position for your client? Um, Jonathan ideally would also like to be um, reunited with his father as well as his brother and sister. We have a very strong family unit. Um, he's very well adjusted. He relates very well to his father. His brother is very patient with him, understanding. But this is overall just really good with him. Um, there was no sexual abuse towards Jonathan. He's not showing any um, developmental issues related to the abuse going on in the household. So basically, he hasn't really suffered from these other allegations, and as such, we think that I'm being him being unified with his family would be the best choice. Okay. Uh, now, one huge legal issue that I see, and I see lots of issues with all three of these cases, um, is with the, in, in, in the context of the uh, care and protection case. Um, if, the, if the care and protection case goes to trial, Norman, um, how is it that, that is the department going to have a difficult time meeting their burden? What What's the standard? If the case does go to trial, what is the standard? The care protection case. Clear and, uh, clear. clear and convincing evidence of these current parental unfitness. So what will your evidence be? I noticed that in the packet of materials that you supplied to the mediators here that uh, 
there's, there's no physical evidence of any rape. So what evidence are you going to put on in the care protection trial, if the case goes to trial, to show that Lee's unfit? Well, it would have to be the, you know, the testimony that was given to the uh, police officer and social okay. worker. So that's, that's my first um, and probably major issue. So you've got uh, um, hearsay statements here, out-of-court statements of uh, these two children. If they're offered in evidence to prove the truth of the matter asserted that they were sexually abused. So whoever, and I imagine you're going to put both on the stand, both Ellen, the social worker, and Kathy, because they both have in interviewed and, and talked with the children initially. So how are you going to get past the hearsay issue? Justin would come over and Jason and Justin and dad would do X, Y, and Z. Uh, Jason told me his dad would carry him up to the bed and blah, blah, blah. Um, are all those statements going to be admissible, Norman? No. Okay, so what are the problems going to be? And how can you, if at all, how can the department overcome them? Well, uh, you want to take them child by child? Let's deal with Alicia first. She's over 10, so. Yeah, that, that uh, over 10, so let's not talk about the statute yeah. quite yet. So, uh, will you be able to get Alicia's statements in? And re you can refer to some of the cases either by name or just by rule if you remember. What does anybody think? Is the department going to be able to get them in as reports? Uh, the reports will come in. Well, again, offered in evidence to the matter uh, asserted, what's the hearsay exception if you're going to get you, 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 you don't want to report, you want Ellen to be able to say, Alicia said such and such. No. So besides the, you know, the 51B is going to come in, uh, that's a good question because the 51B is going to come in, but it's only coming in to set the stage. It's not coming in as substantive evidence. So while the actual written reports might come in, Section it's, you know, the department wants these two witnesses who heard the kids firsthand, you know, emotionally and whatnot. Okay, so um, Alina's saying, is, is there the possibility of fresh complaint or, or first complaint? Could you explain that and how that would get in, if at all? Because they were the, the first uh, uh, testimony that was given by the children the first right. statements that first were, given, statement were given to Ellen. To, to the police officer and then to the uh, social worker were given right after the events that took place. So if Norman tries to introduce, say, you know, Kathy at trial or Ellen, the minute she starts to say, Alicia said, defense counsel objects, um, department okay. might say, Your first Honor, I'm, I'm offering this as first complaint evidence. What's the problem with that? The events didn't take place right away. They were talking about the events that were like. Does that matter? Remember in the uh, in the um, the, nurse, the the daycare center case, the MRL case. Um, events in, in in the first first complaint, fresh complaint doctrine. While it, it, the events could could have happened even you know 15 months later or something. But it has to do with the sort of the child's mindset as well. Um, the child, while still being traumatized 15 months later, tells his mother, right, that clown did this to me. So I don't think that that's the issue. Could it be a corroboration of other evidence? Corroboration, because if, if you're offering these statements to Kathy or Ellen, you meaning the department, um, and over objection of defense counsel that this is hearsay, and in telling the judge, oh no judge, it's not hearsay, it's just evidence of first complaint. Well, that means that those two uh, um, witnesses are on the stand, not for the truth of the matter asserted, they're on the stand to testify, 
to something to something that the victim told them, and the victim will be corroborating because the victim's going to be telling the story. But I've heard that you know there's a, a problem with the children testifying, so they may not testify. Mm -hmm. So that could be a problem that that it, it, you know it, it can come in, but only for a certain purpose. How about another? Uh, did you think of another? State? Mental state. So, for example, um, Alicia does say something like, I hate him and he's a child molester. It's a spontaneous utterance. Uh, uh, is, is, is that a possibility, Norman? I don't, I don't know why. Uh, I mean, you might not be able to get everything in that she said. But if you can get it in for some kind of spontaneous utterance, or if you want to try to get everything else that in, remember the Jennifer case. But only for state of mind. It's still not to prove the truth of the matter asserted. And that's my concern here, that you might be able to get her statements in, but is it going to rise to the level of clear and convincing evidence of least unfitness toward her? You don't have physical evidence. Um, Justin's the key to this. Justin is the key. Um, father was initially prosecuted, you know, in the criminal case. Justin might be able to testify in the camp protection case already. Um, but I'm going to throw a real um, something at you. <laughs> I forget what the word is. Um, and this really, really happened. Justin and his parents uh, have moved out of state. They want nothing to do with the prosecution. So you, you've lost that no, case because not. that case is going to go away. Um, so you don't have Justin testifying in the criminal protection case. You don't have him as corroborating anything, even in the, the criminal case. So now we're back to, again, clear, you know, clear and convincing evidence. You've got just Alicia's out of court um, statement. What about now? Kelly mentioned um, Lee's, Lee's um, quote, admission, because he did make a statement. Can that come in? Can Ellen testify as to what Lee, Ke Kelly saying yes. Why? How does that come in? Is that not an out-of-court statement? Who is Lee in the Karen protection case? Lee's the defendant. In the Karen protection case. Remember, the care protection case is the, uh, the lead children, care protection of the lead children. And remember, you studied that everybody gets counsel. I mean, uh, Elizabeth is, is, is counsel by statute. So what is he in the case? He's a party, is he not? Okay. So how does that statement come in? Ellen can say it, but how is it that she can say, we told me, because initially, Oh, wait a minute. It's an out of court statement. It's a, party, so often, it's a party's own statement against the party. Exactly, a statement of a party so, opponent. So that can come in. All right. So, so, so far, what we have is um, Alicia's statements, maybe for state of mind. Uh, Alicia's statements, at least some of the, the exclamation statements for spontaneous you know, utterance. Uh, maybe first complaint, or probably not, because the children aren't going to testify. Dad's admission. Um, Alina's going to testify, right, Alina? Because you are the investigator. Your report's going to come in. The report has hearsay and multiple level, total full hearsay. But the judge will accept that report with the hearsay. You'll you'll be subject to cross examination. You will be able to say, Ellen told me, because you can identify the source. You will be able to say. Kathy told me. You will be able to say Alicia told me. Um, but you'll have to say Alicia told me the statements I made earlier were not true, right? Can I so, say Alicia told me uh, even though Alicia is not going to testify? How is that? Yes, because you're the, remember, you're the court appointed investigator. That's the exception. 21A, remember, says that care protection cases, the rules of evidence. However, the qualified experts um, can. Uh, and that support appointed investigator can testify as to hearsay, uh, as long as he or she is subject to cross-examination, if she can. But I'm still having a problem here that 
possibly even those pieces that we just identified that are going to be able to come in are still not enough to rise to the level of clear convincing evidence of Lee. Now let's turn to Jason. Um, and, and Marina, I know that you, you know, your role is to advocate Jason's wish to stay home, but it looks like if the judge is going to be holding the um, Chapter 233, Section 83 hearing, and that would be held prior to the care protection trial, um, and as an adequate statement, uh, the statutory exception, adequate statement of a child under 10, um, it's likely going to come in in the care and protection case. If the statement is made to the people who are willing to testify in court. Yes, and that would be Ellen and Kathy. The no. And that would be Ellen and Kathy. Right. So, so it's going to come in in the care and protection case. Let me just jump for one second relative to the, the statutory exception to the criminal case. So we still have Commonwealth v. Lee, uh, the criminal case against his children. Under 233.81, however, if the district attorney is going to be looking to get Jason's statements in the criminal case, you've got to jump through more hoops, right? Yeah. And what are those hoops? <laughs> Somebody help her. In 233.81, remember that was uh, the uh, Commonwealth v. Collin case that you guys talked about last time? And why is it harder in the criminal case to get Jason's statements in? What's the burden of quote in the criminal case? It's beyond a, uh, a reasonable, reasonable doubt, doubt. Plus, what are, what are Lee's rights in the criminal case? And how do they right. compare with Lee's rights in the in the care and protection case? He's facing case. jail time for the criminal matter. Yeah. But he's facing losing his kids. But I think it's, he just had more. So what do you think the likelihood of success is in getting Jason's statements in, in the uh, uh, criminal case? Alina, you're saying slim. What what are the requirements? He has to be necessary, reliable, and corroborated. Mm -hmm. So. And what about unavailability? Yeah, and it has to be the witnesses should be unavailable. The court has to declare them unavailable. Well, let me ask you this, Kelly. Could you, um, um, you know, if, if you were an expert in this yeah. regard? Could you be making a report that the children will be traumatized if they had to testify, that sort of thing? Would that make them then unavailable yes. per well, the statute? Yes. Well, that would be the argument, and then the judge would determine mm -hmm. unavailability. Based now, on that. but here's the thing. Even if Jason's statements come in in the criminal case, again, there's no, uh, there's no physical evidence of rape. So what have you got? You have Jason's statements. You have nothing. Right? What do you have in order to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that we committed um, rape, sexual molestation, et cetera? Uh, so there are real problems evidence-wise in the, the, the criminal and the care and protection case. What do we do? And is there any, now I want to come back to when Elizabeth was, re, when you were recounting um, all of the possible ways this case could be um, negotiated, minus the, that he would admit to sex. Because that's your problem. You don't want him to admit to sexual abuse. Uh, if there was no criminal case, that might be a possibility in terms of re reunification. But when you have the district attorney here, ready, willing, and able to prosecute him. Because remember, from day one with the 51A, that's how the, uh, that's how the DA got uh, involved in the case. Because the DA got the 51A, the 51B, the service plan. So if the service plan says admit to sexual abuse, then the DA has more to prosecute him with. Now he's involved. Usually the DA is all involved with the whole camera. That, that's the point. Also. That's the point. Right. You're getting all this information. Um, so how can? But yet we're hearing a lot of positive things. That the children are still doing great in school. They want to stay together. They want to stay home. They say they love the dad. School teachers, etc. People on the outside are saying he looks like a model parent, etc. 
Um, the investigator is saying it, 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 even if you know something happened, it looks like there's a possibility of reunification. Uh, so how can how can we do that short of sending Lee to jail? Please on probation and have a mentor and outpatient facility that specifically deals with. So when you say place him on probation, have him uh, do an admission to the criminal case. Is that what you're saying? Well, you want him to, to take a plea. Well, you can't just so. place him on probation, right? Right. Um, <laughs> no quaff. And, and yeah. <laughs> no, no quaff on this. No. <laughs> no. And it looks like, I mean, I don't think the DA is willing to, to drop the case, yet she understands that there are problems evidence-wise with the case. Same thing with the department. They don't, they're not going to drop it. But they're, uh, they're really worried if the state you know, from both sides really it, it, you know, might lose if the case goes to trial. So in some sense, then you wouldn't have any protection. Lee is like, well, go for it. You guys have to prove it. But if you put you children know? on the stand, can you ask them a question why they gave this information? In the well, I've I'm, I'm, I'm been told now by the GAL that she doesn't think the children should testify because of trauma issues, etc. So even if the department calls them, and, and maybe through counsel too, counsel might say, you know, they're, they're not taking the stand, they're taking some sort of privilege, or they might be traumatized. Uh, the department certainly can call them as witnesses. The question is, will they actually testify? Are there any other problems? Okay, I'm just trying to remember if I brought everything else up. What about the evidence wise or concerning? I, I mean, you haven't really mentioned would the uncle or the grandmother be involved in any of the testimony? No, they 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 wouldn't. Um, remember we talked before about foster parents and about parties intervening and that sort of thing. You know, only if it, it, uh, you know. If they had knowledge, you know, in the department or the DA's office through their investigation found out that other family members had knowledge, they would certainly call them as witnesses. But we don't see that here. Seems like be we don't see witnesses. that any. What's that? Seems to me like there'll be character witnesses at the trial. Yeah, I mean, they don't want to help them. Yeah, right. exactly. He's going to be on his side. Right? Yeah. Lily, can you help at all? Well, what? So somehow keep the care and protection case open. Yeah, because, uh, because you don't you don't have enough. They, I don't know. Is it something like a, what Alina was saying proposal. to keep? Yeah. It, it, to mention you mention your proposal again. Could you summarize that uh, again? What we uh, proposed is just to keep the temporary custody to DSS and to keep the case open and review it within the next three months. Yeah, like with the possibility of reunification right. with service plan, but again the. What's the service plan going to consist of? What would the department want, Norman? Well, the department well, we want, want, we want the, uh, the, the father would have to, you know, uh, admit to the, the some yep. level of abuse so that yep. he can be treated. <laughs> but I wanted to ask you a question. When you said that, that, that Justin's family moved away and that's it, so I mean, you know, yeah. He's beyond so the, the, the district attorney's lo yeah lost the so, speed power. So I mean, you power. know, that's then that's yeah. uh, that's yeah. an unavailability exception. Uh, unavailability of who? Of Justin. Justin. Uh, right, but not of Jason. But he can't go forward. I can't go forward with the case because he's Justin's out. I could still go forward, couldn't I? Oh, with Justin's case. Yes. Right. By him being unavailable. True. But you'd be faced with the same uh, 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 issue that you have with Jason's case. That's all you've got. That's not going to rise to the level of the owner reasonable doubt. So you use both you cases to things. try to work with the department in order to get, and his attorney in order to get the best mm -hmm. situation. You know, family. the problem here is because the alleged abuse is a family member, a father, um, who's also being prosecuted. You know, how do you, how do you, you know, get to the best thing for the entire family, you know? 
And how do you know what's the best thing? Absolutely. How do you know? Gentlemen? Well, that's one of the difficult things about this. When you read the facts mm -hmm. and these kids are doing really well, they're adjusted and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. They love this guy. They're afraid of losing him. But, right. I mean, what he's done. If he's done. Well. Um, I, you, one of the problems that I don't know if you guys are seeing it in this particular case also deals with the suggestive questioning. Um, not, you don't see as many issues with that kind of questioning today because this been is an older case. There's been you know so much training in terms of interviewing child witnesses and so forth. Because if you I, I don't know if you noticed, but some of the questions that the uh, social worker and police. Um, ask these children are so, so, so suggestive. You'll see some of that on the videotape that you guys are going to watch too. Um, we, we make a point about that. You have to be careful when you're interviewing that you're not putting, you know, the words and the ideas in the children's mouths um, and brains and so forth. So uh, it, 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 that's why I said, do we really know? You know, we know what Alan is saying that Alicia said. But if you have, for example, a child that's extremely upset knowing that her dad um, was in jail or was arrested for molesting uh, somebody else, she might be willing to say, oh, he's a child molester. Uh, she might be willing to say, uh, uh, you know, upon being questioned by authorities, uh, did he do it? Oh, yes. You know, let me show you this doll. Is this what? Oh, yeah, that's what he did. Um, so. I'm not suggesting that this didn't happen, but it's, 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 it might be possible in some cases with some kind of extreme um, questioning that's not going to hold muster once these witnesses you know, get on the stand at trial, too. So that's another problem in the case. If the case got, does go to trial and the department tries to prove um, through these witnesses that the statements weren't back true, they really get going to get picked apart, if they're allowed to even testify to the, the, the hearsay statements. So, I think so does so. he admit, does he do some sort of admission with a probation, with a suspended sentence? Will that make the case go, go away in terms of Lee not having to go to jail and, 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 and um, possibly having a reunification? with his children, not immediately, but maybe months you know, down the line. Are, are you leaving? Well, so she, yeah, you are. So you'd want to make some type of a, I mean, Please. the DA would want him oh, to go into a, into a treatment. Are. Yeah. Treatment, he definitely yeah. has to go into a but, treatment. But, you know, does Elizabeth, as defense counsel, realize all the holes in the state's case and say, you know what, I'm walking away from this table. I, I don't have to concede anything, you know. Um, but but he seems like he wants that, to. Yeah, right. right. So he, he wants to be reunited with his children. But he wants to be re reunited. He doesn't want to admit to anything. Well, I, I guess so, I am. Again, repercussion of both losing the children and being uh, jailed. No, but you were saying something. I'm sorry. Well, I don't. I, I was going to confer with the uh, district attorney because I don't understand. Well, it just seems to me that uh, the unavailability of of Justin. I just think that that's damaging. You know, that's an exception to the hearsay. One of the exceptions to the hearsay rule. And it's in what case? In in Justin's case, mm -hmm. the the. the There's a statement. We what? still just have his statement for Justin, just like we have. Yeah, his yeah. So she's going to stop the trial. She's going to do an opening statement, and then she's going to say, "Here, Judge, two thirty-three eighty-one. Here's his statement. Uh, I rest. Okay, is Lee guilty beyond a reasonable doubt? On that alone. Yeah, but that's the same thing you have with. Well, except well. Yeah, because he didn't meet with social workers or anything. He just no. met. Well, you would you would only bring the police that interviewed him. Yep. And yep. to back up yep. his story. Yep. You can certainly get it in. It's you can't meet your burden at trial. Both with the, the criminal case, case of Justin, the criminal case of the children, the care and protection trial. 
And many child sexual abuse cases have issues even today like this. Yeah. One question. If he admits that he committed this, say he pleads, and he doesn't go to prison, he will be registered as a sexual offender, which means. Good point. He will be. Good uh, he point. He will never get a court report, like I have from my experience with the school. I cannot enter the my kids' school unless I. Good, good point. Them. Yes, that's a whole other issue. You know, the registry. Well, it depends on what he would plead to, right? Huh? It would depend on what he would plead to. So I'm sure his attorney is not going to plead with the DA to anything that's going to bring him on. To, I mean, they, he might not even admit to any of the things and just do maybe a simple assault and end up taking. Yeah, I mean, if the DA is willing to, you know what? I. We have huge I'm not. issues, <laughs> in, no, we have huge right. issues in this case, so I'll drop it down to an assault right. and a simple assault and battery. Just With so you can be a probation for something. Right. But you can get and conditions to that too. Yeah, yeah. So that might be a way out of it. But you're right, he'd be on the sexual offender registry. Yeah. And there'd be huge issues with that as well. So the family will never be reunited. He cannot show up at school, he cannot pick up right. the kids, and Jonathan is only three years old, yeah. so what yeah. are you going to do? Can go to Dorica. <laughs> EB is a skinner. Like would okay, that's the end of the negotiating session because there's no negotiation, and I think you guys have realized it. Yeah, um, I mean, and we did, we did have a session like that at the time, that um, and he was offered, you know, like time, <laughs> and and he said no, he said no, and he took the chance, and um, the judge made some, um, the judge made some. <laughs> legal mistakes. <laughs> oh, that's all I can say, because the judge just wanted to hear it. He let in the state, Alicia, uh, he let in uh, Ellen, Ellen Cathy's statements um, of hearsay, um, said that he was admitting them for all kinds of reasons. You mentioned the, the fresh complaint, um, even with the children not testifying. He let them in for state of mind. Um, he heard from the court appointed investigator. Um, again, there was no statute at the time, so that wasn't part of it. And um, if I think of it, I'll make copies of the findings of fact because he actually adjudicated the children in need of care and protection. And again, he, he was le he might have been morally right, but he was legally wrong because the, there was no clear and convincing evidence of current parental unfitness. So, um, parents' counsel and children's counsel uh, immediately filed an appeal. But in the interim, let me see. At one point, Alicia was back, it was also with um, Uncle Anthony. But then the three of them, so the three of them were then removed to a, a foster uh, home and they were in the home for quite a long time. It actually became uh, the family um, was uh, okay by the department as a pre adoptive family. The care and protection trial, by the way, went first. The criminal case stayed open. They were smart. They didn't dismiss it, but knowing they had very little. So slowly the children started um, feeling safer and came back to where they were in the beginning and you know made the statements and they actually testified in the criminal case I mean, they were a lot terrible witnesses terrible witnesses but he was um, he was not only found guilty of he, he was found guilty of rape i think it was rape of both of the children yeah i think it was rape um not just indecent assault and battery i think it was found in any event, he's, he's found guilty and is trucked down to uh, North or South Carolina. Where, where, where were they from? North Carolina. Yeah, so he gets an on and after. Because if you remember, they lived there too. So you've got incidents in Massachusetts and also incidents in, you know, oh, what I'm saying? Have right after twice. Yeah. Um, and there was one other fact that came They try him down there? I don't know if they tried him down there or on the end, in the end if there was an admission, but I know he did get on an after time. Um, one fact that came to light later on, and no one knew for sure that they, and this is really sad, they thought that mom had actually killed herself um, and, dro and, and 
that if you remember from the facts, Alicia had not been living with Dad. There's something that said when I went back to live with Dad. Yeah. Well, he was, uh, she was from, there's so many cases now that run together, but yeah. was not Alicia the, the oh. a product of the of marriage prior? Alicia and Jason both were. Yeah, okay. Yeah, they both were. But it looked like they were separated for a while, but right. that Jason stayed with Dad. And I don't know where Jonathan was either one. He was born. Well, yeah. Jason was, Jonathan was a biological child. Yes. And Jason yeah. was adopted, so that's why they always stayed. So that's how the case, and, and, and because the, the, uh, the, the, in the meantime, the appeal ended up getting withdrawn because of the events that occurred. How much time did after you get, that? approximately? Um, not like five years, years and you get like a... No, 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 but long, long, long. So, because we had pre-adoptive parents, and the happy ending to it was that the three children, you know, with ages so different too, especially Jonathan, were able to stay together, and the initial foster home also became the um, adoptive home um, as well. That was all I needed to, yeah. Can I ask you, um, just um, before pounding through these notes, the export, the reporters coming in as an expert, so all of their stuff, do you what? You mean section the investigator, investigator under section. Report and all the hearsay that's in that camp comes in? Yeah. What section was that? Okay. Oh, 21A as well as case law, but it's case law really. If you look at these cases, there's always the investigator's right. report that comes in. It comes in. It's not going to be enough if that's all you have, right. but it's sort of part of the package of clear and convincing evidence. Well, that's what they do the hearsay also, right? Yeah. That's not enough. Yep. That's all yep. you rely on. Yeah. And this is exactly. care and protection. I'm sorry? In the care and protection. Yes. yes. Hearsay is not enough. Hearsay is not enough because it has to be clear and convincing evidence. That's still up. It's not as high as criminal standard of proof, but it's still a very high burden. It's still a very high burden. It's okay. higher than, you know, preponderance is just for the civil. Adoption. I right? think the clear and convincing was just for when you're taking the parental rights for adoption. No. No, because Massachusetts, the, the way that Massachusetts followed Santosky versus Kramer is that Massachusetts instituted at the end of the care protection trial, we're going to follow the standard of clear and convincing evidence. And I think that was the Stevens. For all CP, whether it's adopted yeah. or just temporary. Yes, yes. Yeah. At trial, it's clear and convincing evidence. 72-hour hearing, it's preponderance, the Robert case. Emergency hearing, it's just reasonable cause. I'm sorry, what, what was the question? He wanted you to repeat that. No, okay, no, so no, emergency no, hearing, reasonable no, cause, no. and that's in the statute, 119.24. Temporary custody or 72-hour hearing, that's the Robert case, preponderance. So each time it goes up. And then the final trial, which could be just custody, care protection, or termination, as Danielle said, is clear and convincing evidence, which is, again, very high. It's a very high standard because you're depriving parents of their custody rights. Reasonable cause, reasonable cause. For the first one. Not to be confused. For the emergency. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Reasonable cause. Reasonable yes, cause. That's what the 51A reporter needs. Reasonable cause. You see reasonable cause a lot as a standard, but it, reasonable cause is very low, low threshold sort of standard. So we should be able, I think, next Tuesday to start medical neglect. Yes. What do we, what do we have after for reading after this? Um, what might happen in the so we are we so we're, the case that we had prepared today to be able to use so the I'm sorry, Amaral's case. Yes. I read through, through those. They yeah, I remember them while they were in the, the yes. popular media, but yes. not really understanding. I know that they led. Do you feel in that case that that was a lot of the inappropriate um, coaching? And I mean, this case that we just did, I really felt the father was kind of guilty. This one, and it wasn't even just remembering what they said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think a lot of that had to do with the coaching of the, you know, go home and ask your kids if they knew a class? Yeah, yeah and if you remember the they time, it was like a lot of hysteria in many states, yeah. you know, surrounding um, issues like that. Oh, well, I'm glad that you brought that up because Remember that Massachusetts is a state that does afford defendants more rights. So in terms of confrontation, 
you know, a defendant really needs to look at the face of someone. But, but now the face yeah. of the kid could, could be a kid sitting at a child size table. Mm -hmm. It could be a kid that doesn't really have to look at the defendant as long as sort of the defendant can see that person. So we do afford more rights in that regard. So if you have a case where there's, you know, a criminal case going on, and even if it's a, you know, like here, a father-child situation, and the child could obviously be, you know, traumatized, um, the, the, the father here or the parent here um, does have fundamental rights relative to confrontation. So keep that in mind. But was there also, though, that there was still, even though it's very slim and small, that they could do it by videotape? Uh, well, um, even though it was, you know just what's weird? Just that now. statute is on still on the books, yes. and it's Commonwealth v. Uh, Bergstrom. Uh, one of the cases held that that that, that statute's unconstitutional. I thought it was. I thought it was in extremely rare situations. It was still all right, but now. Uh, yeah, Bergs. It's the Bergstrom case, uh, 1988, and I don't know if there's anything since. Um, Elizabeth, do you know? I know. Relative to the electronic. Uh, um, means outside the physical. See, that's the point. In Massachusetts, it, it can't be outside the physical presence of the defendant. The defendant has to be able to look at the accuser. Even a child. Even a child. Yeah, I yeah. Mean, the, 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 they, you know, the words are yeah. real specific in Article 12. Yeah, yes. So. All right, so we, we'll stop medical neglect, all right, on Tuesday. And you guys will watch the tape Thursday. on Thursday. I don't know. I